Hey everyone, in this video, I want to talk about Azure Copilot. This is starting to roll out as we speak. Today, you have to go and request to sign up, but I wanted to go through exactly how this technology is working. Because I always think if we understand how something works, it gives us the confidence, the trust to actually start adopting and leveraging the technology. Now, when you hear about the co-pilots, you always hear it talked about with generative AI and large language models, the ability to interact with natural language, and that model is going to predict the next word and the next word and the next word to an end of sequence, a response. And it's a very natural, interactive type experience. And obviously they're bringing these to more and more technologies. So I want to talk a little bit about, well, how do these actually work? And then how do they work with our data in the context of Azure? So if we take a step back, if we remember that this model we use is GPT-4. And so the GPT-4 comes from OpenAI. So you have OpenAI. And what they do is they have huge amounts of data that they use for training. And really the whole point is you have this large um, neural network of parameters and the training essentially works out, well, what are the optimal weights and biases that will make it fit the training data, which is this huge amount of knowledge. Now this takes a huge amount of time. It takes a huge amount of GPU and computational power but once that training has been completed by tuning all of the parameters available, you get your large language model that then you can use to feed in a prompt, the information I give it, and it does an inference. It does that prediction of the most probable next token, the next token, next token, i.e. our response. And so we're talking about this GPT-4 at time of recording is the most powerful model from OpenAI. Over time, they'll obviously release newer ones. I'm sure over time, Microsoft will adopt newer ones. But OpenAI trained that model. And I can think that all lives in the OpenAI space. So then if we think of a boundary, now we have Microsoft. Microsoft are not using the OpenAI instance of the running model that is used for OpenAI services. What they do is they take a copy. So Microsoft have multiple copies. If you think there's, well, it's Microsoft 365, there's Dynamics 365, there's Azure OpenAI services, uh, there's Azure Copilot. They take a copy of that large language model, which once trained is read only at this point. I'm not adding new knowledge into it. It has been trained on that huge amount of knowledge that enables it to have those interactions, but it's now set in stone. It's not modifying its behavior. And that really is actually a key point. So Microsoft do not fine tune these models. There are ways to adapt behavior of maybe the types of interactions you have with it. This is just the regular GPT-4 large language model. They're not tuning it. They're not changing things. All of the interactions come from really a, a lot of work with the prompt, the prompt engineering, i.e. what we give it for its input, and then adding extra information. You'll hear about this retrieval augmented uh, generation rag, which is all about, well, how can I give it more information so it can create these great experiences for us? And that's exactly what's happening. So the model is just the regular model, and then it's how we interact with it that actually gives us that great experience. So how then, if this is the case, does it get information on our knowledge, on our Azure subscriptions, on the Microsoft documentation? And that's what I wanna walk through um, to give you that idea. The whole point is it's its ability to go and via this Azure Copilot, which is the orchestrator, go and talk to other things. And I did videos specifically on 
retrieved augmented generation and vectors and embeddings. I did a whole module on generative AI. I think it's something everyone should understand. In this day and age, this is gonna become more and more common pace. So if you understand those concepts, I think it will really help you out. So if you have a little bit of spare time, I would highly recommend going and watching those. But let's think about, just walk through what happens in an interaction with Azure Copilot. So I am the user. So I'm my user and I'm interacting with the Azure portal. Now in my interaction with the Azure portal, I'm on a certain page, on a certain resource. So there's a certain context with what I'm doing in the Azure portal at any particular moment in time. And then I bring up the Copilot option and I ask it something. So I'm asking it, I'm giving it a prompt. So at this point, I have a prompt that I'm typing my question. Um, what managed disks am I not using? What's my most expensive resource? How can I make this VM more highly available? Are there any outages affecting me right now? Hey, help me create a manifest to deploy a Kubernetes service. Whatever it is, that prompt and my current context is sent to the Azure Copilot. Now at this point, that alone, if I just sent it to the large language model, so say this is step one, would not be that useful. There's not enough information. Remember, all it's been trained on was that initial data, which was not Azure specific in any way. It has no knowledge to anything I have. It needs some more useful information. So where is that more useful information? Well, I could think about, well, obviously, we have things like the Microsoft Docs, which are changed very frequently and updated with new capabilities. So yes, the Azure Copilot can go and interact with those. But then also, remember, there's the Azure Resource Manager. That is the control plane for everything we do in Azure. That is our entry point. So through that, I have things like the Azure Resource Graph, which enables me to query information about anything in Azure. There's things like cost management. There's the health, service health, um, support capabilities. And then I'll talk more about this, but then there's also in this case, some specific sets of skills and functionality that are being exposed with the Copilot. Because if, if I think about it for a second, Azure Resource Manager can hook in and do anything in Azure. However, realize some of those things it could do are very powerful if I have the permissions, um, delete resources, modify them, and it's a bit different from saying like Office. With Office, if I went and updated a slide with Copilot and I didn't like it, I could do Control Z and I'll undo it. Well, that's not the same with these real resources. And so what Microsoft has been very careful about is when it's exposing functionality that can actually modify or delete things, they wanna make sure the right guardrails are in place, the right checks, the right confirmations are in place so we don't do harm through these natural language interactions. So the whole point is these are putting all of the right guardrails confirmations, et cetera, et cetera, around anything it may be interacting with. So it's just a really important point with what we wanna do. Okay, so there's all this information available to us. So this is the point of the co-pilot. So one of the things the co-pilot is doing, it's the orchestrator for our AI interactions. So I give it a prompt in some basic context. It looks at this and then it works out what other information may be required. So it can then send to these some questions. It might be run a resource graph query, and give me some information on cost management, give me information from the docs, whatever it is, it gets a response back with additional data. And this is that retrieval augmented generation. 
we're getting additional information we're gonna to give to the prompt. So this data is now used for grounding. The request I'm going to make, the prompt, I'm grounding it in this additional data it can go and get. The Copilot will now also modify the prompt. It will create something called a meta prompt. So now it can actually go and ask the large language model, hey, here's the meta prompt. So it can add in extra specifications to what is being sent. It could also describe, hey, here's what I want you to do. Here's some information. So it's also gonna add all that information that we got. But it can also describe functions. By the way, um, I have the ability to call these functions if you need more information. So what might happen is this will then generate the response. But sometimes it may actually respond with a plan. And the plan is, hey, I want you to run these things for me. So there'll be a few iterations of this inference, these responses, to make sure it gets the right information. And then this can tidy up when it finally does get a response. And great. You can go and send it back. And I get this nice response to the user. And they're all happy and delighted about what they're seeing. Um, and so that is fundamentally how it's working. Now, the key part you see in this, what we don't have, is the large language model has no direct access to anything of yours. It cannot go and hook into Azure Resource Manager or anything else. It is a read-only model with fixed neurons and the parameters. All it can do is act on the data it's given and give a response. If it needs more data, hey, I ask it, what are my um, unused managed disks and how much is it costing me? Well, it might initially get sent a resource graph query maybe of, help, here's my managed disks that are not connected to a VM. But then it's gonna say, hey, I need you to run a query against cost management to get me the pricing for these resources. So then this would go and do some more retrieval augmented generation, send a prompt back with the history of the previous and now the cost information. So now it can go and give a response saying, oh, it's costing me this much. And then it can go and send it back. So it always has to go via the co-pilot, the orchestrator. And so you'll sometimes see iterations because it wants to go and get more data, but it has no access whatsoever. It has to go through the co-pilot that can enforce all those responsible AI principles and everything else. That brings us on to an important point then, because one of the things people always get scared about is, well, okay, well, what is the co-pilot now gonna enable the user to do that maybe they couldn't do before? So let's focus on this side of the interaction with the co-pilot talking to different things here. And really the most important thing to consider is remember the user has a certain set of roles, the role-based access control on the Azure resources. The Azure Copilot, when it talks is not running as its own service principle with complete permissions. Everything the Copilot does is what we call it on behalf of flow, i.e. it can only act on what the user can act as. What the user can see, it can see. If the user can't see it, it can't see it. So it is acting on behalf of the user for all of the interactions with the Azure Resource Manager. If I don't have permission to run this Azure Resource Graph query against those resources, nor can this. If I don't have the permission to see that resource or modify that resource, nor can this. It cannot do anything the user can do. And the key point is, we're going via ARM. And remember, what does ARM do? ARM is our control plane, and ARM is what? Well, it enforces any policy. So we're not bypassing any policy, any guardrails we have configured. ARM is what enforces role-based access control. 
so I can't bypass any permissions that are set. ARM is what enforces budgets. Copilot cannot do anything you couldn't do already through the portal. I honestly think of it a little bit, the old argument used to hear of PowerShell. When PowerShell first came about, everyone freaked out. It's like, oh no, you must disable PowerShell. People are gonna wreak havoc. PowerShell didn't let you do anything you couldn't have already done another way. It may have made it more efficient, but it wasn't bypassing anything. It was just another way of doing things. This is exactly the same. Copilot makes us more efficient. It helps us if we're not sure how to do something. It will suggest next paths. It can help us do certain activities, but it can't do anything that I couldn't already do if I found my way around the portal, if I worked out a script. It's just it would take me a lot longer. So it is enforcing. It can only do what I can do. It's still going through the regular APIs. So it only has my level of access. That's really the most important thing. So it is only my access. It's not a back door. It's not gonna do anything else. And one of the nice things here, if we think about it for a second then, because we are just using ARM, well, there are, remember, all those other resources I may have. So I may have resources, on-premises, server operating systems, whatever it may be. So now, if I ARC enable them, what does ARC do? ARC extends the Azure control plane to other resources and also lets me apply certain Azure skills and capabilities to those resources. Well, if the control plane is extended and knows about it, Technically, the Copilot can hook in. So if I run an Azure Resource Graph query, for example, through Copilot for its interactions, it would know about my ARC-enabled resources as well. So it's actually really nice that it's, it's not recreating the wheel or doing anything special there. I'm gonna be able to take advantage of all those things as well. So hopefully that helps clear up a big element of, well, is it safe to use? Um, is it going to wreck havoc? It can only do what the user can already do. It's just making me more efficient. It will help me along the way. Now, I don't want to do a big demo of Copilot. There's been great sessions and great things done already. But I guess in case you've not seen it, I'll show a couple of quick things and maybe just have a little bit of fun. Now, again, today you have to onboard and there are certain requirements around it. But once you are onboarded, you'll see your little Copilot uh, up here. And there are limitations, and I'll talk a bit more about that, to how many chats you can have a day and how many interactions per chat. So obviously, this is all using um, resources. So you obviously have to be careful with this. But it's asking me, hey, how can I help? I mean, what's the most powerful thing we might ever want to do? Can you change the theme to black? And then you can see it sort of thinking about things. So this may actually, oh, and there it's done. I'll just stop that. So you, you saw it go through as interaction. So that may have actually been going back and forth uh, a couple of times to say, hey, what should I do? What the documentation? Okay, what's the API call? But we saw that in action to complete the thing I was trying to do. Um, I've never even actually tried this. Can you set it back again? I'm not even sure if that will work. I've never actually tried typing that, but it does. So notice that that's really cool. So it changed it back to blue It's because it has the context. So one of the things that happens here is when it has these interactions and we talked about there's a certain number of chats it allows, when it sends this meta prompt, it also sends it the history of the previous interactions so it has a larger context to make it a lot more natural interaction. If it wasn't doing that, when I said change it back, it'd be like, change, what are you talking about? Back to what? It has the context. So that's actually a really nice feature here. Okay, so what else could we do? Um, so it can generate CLI scripts. Um, can you create a script to start all VMs with an owner of John Savile. 
So now it can go away, it can look at documentation, it can go and understand, well, okay, what does an owner of John Savile mean? And it can go and create a script. And notice it's doing that, determining what to do a couple of times. It might be bouncing back and forth to the large language model, back and forth, the orchestrator is gonna go and talk to the arm. It might be looking at the documentation to work out. So notice here, it's giving me my answer. Okay, one option is AZVM query tags owner John Savile. And then I could start those IDs. So it's helping me do that task. And one of the nice things you're actually seeing here is it does have the run button. So if I do the run button, it will open up a cloud shell and I could copy the code and just execute it. So it makes it very easy to interact. And it understands the monitoring information. It understands KQL, which is used for things like log analytics and of course the resource graph. It understands uh, YAML for AKS manifests. Um, list all my unused public IPs. So here it would have to go and look at the Azure resource graph. Once it's worked out, what is the right KQL to ascertain what is the query to find what is an unused IP? So see, it's so looking at resources where it contains public IP address and is empty properties is IP. So it's working out what is the query so it's looking for this is empty. And then it will go and run it for me. And now it's going and found, okay, I've got an empty public IP address. And notice it's then giving me suggestions. We'll delete them. Uh, maybe assign it. And I could do the same thing with uh, disks. Uh, show me all of my unused disks. Then what's the cost of the disks? How could I delete them? I could ask it to summarize my costs for the last three months. And one of the great things, actually, let's just look up the documentation. Um, because as we go through, it has these enhanced scenarios. So if we look at the documentation, it gives a whole bunch of prompts you could try. And it, notice here it's doing a much more complicated KQL query. It can help you deploy VMs more effectively. And this is actually a really nice one. So remember it talked about the idea of the context. So imagine I'm just creating a VM. Let's create a new virtual machine. And let's say I've just select a region. And maybe I'm like, well, Joe, I'm not sure exactly what to do. So I might say, how can I make this VM more resilient? And while it's doing this, this is what I was talking about. So today, and this may or may not change, I can have 10 requests per chat, and I think it's five chats per 24 hour period. So it's not like I can just do an infinite number. So notice it's saying, look, I can help in a number of ways. Multi-zonal, VM scale sets, public IP. And it's saying, hey, do you want me to help you select multiple zones? So if I select this, notice what it just did it automatically went in and set me to two zones, which now means it created two VMs. And then it's gonna guide me. It's like, hey, do you want me to help you add a load balancer to your solution? So it's gonna walk me through that complete process of helping me. And this is its, its whole point of what it's trying to do. But I'm just gonna cancel that out. Okay. So what else could it do? Um, how can I make my storage accounts more secure? And once again, it does this really nice interaction. Now I have lots of storage accounts. So one of the things it's gonna do, look, you open up the page and it's like, select one. Which storage account do you want me to go and look at for you? So I'll say, okay, I'll pick that one. Do you want me to run a security check on that account? Yes, please. And then it will go and do an analysis based on its best practices, based on its knowledge, based on the skills that remember those different product groups may have created 
that can be the most benefit that has the right guardrails on it. And it can come back and guide me. And it's the fact that it, you have these skills, you're gonna see different levels of interaction with different services, they're gonna grow over time. But it's all been done with safety in mind to make sure, hey, we, something doesn't happen that we don't want to do. And that's given me a bunch of recommendations. Hey, look, oh, it doesn't require secure transfer. Oh, it's not using private endpoints, allows anonymous blob access, so a whole bunch of great things. And then again, it gives me some recommended next steps. Well, okay, well, what are private endpoints? How can I enable them? How to enable secure transfer? So it's constantly guiding me through. Maybe right now, um, are there any Azure problems impacting me? So then it can go and hook into service health and let me know, are there any active incidents going on that might be impacting any of my resources or subscriptions? No, there's not. I'm healthy and all good to go. So it's constantly helping me do the things that I'm trying to do. And once again, if we look at the docs, so I'm not gonna go through all of these, but for example, like Kubernetes, it will help create a manifest file. It's just quicker than me typing it in. But hey, you ask it what you want it to do, and it will go and create it for you. It can, again, generate the CLI scripts, and there's examples of here, we saw that as well. Um, optimize code, so I, it can help me do what I'm doing. Things like Cosmos DB, currently hooking directly in Cosmos DB, um, actually with its interactions. So if I look at Data Explorer, you'll see it has its own direct hooking to query with Copilot, so you can use natural language to interact with it. But different services are hooking at different levels. But for all of these services, they're following the same principles. It's using the same pattern of it can only do what you can do. Everything about ARM, the policy, the RBAC, the budget is informed. If there's any risk, hey, these skills have the right guardrails to prompt you and guide you. It's like all the co-pilots, it's there to help you do your job. It's there to help me be more effective. Um, but as you saw today, there were some limits around the number of interactions per chat, number of chats I can have, because that LLM, it takes a huge amount of time, as I talked about, to do the training, but it also requires a huge amount of GPU and power to do the inferencing. So there, there's, there's protections in place to make sure it really doesn't get out of hand. Now, there is no pricing details right now. I don't know if there will be pricing, I don't know what that pricing will be, no idea but that will come over time as it moves out of these private previews. And obviously when it's GA, they'll announce whatever the pricing model will be. Now I did wanna discuss two things that I've already seen come up. One is, can I limit which subscriptions can use Azure Copilot? Because today you enable it at a tenant level and then all of the subscriptions that trust that tenant get it. And the answer is no, you can't. Because remember the portal, if you look at the portal, this is not subscription specific. Within the portal, this, this bar at the top is just the Azure portal. And then yes, I can granularly select a certain subscription, but the portal is multi-subscription. So there is no concept of turning the Copilot on or off at a subscription level. You, you, do, you don't do that. The next thing that comes up is, well, okay, well, I want to stop Copilot being able to make any changes. I'm a big infrastructure as code shop. I want to make sure people don't start using Copilot to change things. And to that, I would say again, Copilot can only do what the user can do, and it can only do what the user can already do in the portal. So if I'm a big infrastructure as code organization, and I want everything done infrastructure as code, well, today, the users could change things in the portal anyway. The Copilot is just another method of interacting with that. If I wanna make sure my users don't change things in the portal, well, then I should really be thinking about well, what are the permissions I'm giving the user? 
So maybe the user ordinarily only has a read permission, so they can go into the portal, they can look at the resources, look at the insights, look at the monitoring, but they don't change anything. Think zero trust, think least privilege, they shouldn't have standing permissions anyway. And then the right way to do the things would be, well, hey, I can have my, write my infrastructure as code, which I then commit to my repo. When I do that commit, hey, it can trigger my CI CD pipeline. And that pipeline runs a certain service principle. And that service principle is the one that maybe has contributor. It is the one that then has the ability to go and deploy. The user can't anyway. So if the user had the right permissions, Copilot won't be able to go and change anything to help the user because the user doesn't have the right permission to anyway. So if I'm big into infrastructure as code, I don't want the portal user, I don't want Copilot to change stuff, they shouldn't be able to do it anyway. There's nothing special about Copilot. The user should be restricted. And sure, I totally get it if there's exceptional circumstances. Well, that's when we use things like PIM. So I could always have the ability that they can get contributor if they PIM up for a time limited window in an exceptional circumstances, you can still do that. But my normal day to day, hey, the user shouldn't have contributor just sitting around anyway, which means when they're using Copilot or the portal or the CLI or anything else, they can just view, they can't change the things. If you wanna disable click ops, don't let them have the permissions the pipeline should have the permissions that goes through the right approvals and the guardrails to check those things. So maybe a longer answer, but no, I can't stop Copilot changing things because it's kind of pointless anyway, because they would just change things through the portal. If I don't want that behavior to happen, I need to set my permissions correctly. Uh, and that's the key point. So I, I hope that answers the questions about it. The whole point is that the copilot is only doing what the user has the permissions to do. It's still going through all of the same API, so all of my normal policy and RBAC and budgets will apply. For anything beyond the more general resource graph, cost management, health, there are special skills that have additional guardrails where I might wanna double check, where I might advise differently. But we saw there's some great interactions with the context around, hey, the VMs, um, the storage accounts, the Cosmos, the AKS. It's there to help me do the job. Nothing I am doing is used to train the model. The train model is read-only. It's a copy from OpenAI. It runs in the Microsoft security and regulatory and trust boundaries. It has zero access to anything. Everything it wants to do, it has to ask the Azure Copilot, which goes and gets the data, runs to make sure we've got the good, responsible AI principles applying. It's running as the user, so it can only do what the user could do anyway. And ultimately, it just helps me do my job better. And that's the point. So as always, I hope this was useful. And until next video, take care.